Okay, as if I haven't shown you about a thousand other ways to show inverse spin on uh, opposite poles of a uh, magnet, I uh, discovered a new way. Actually, I didn't discover it. It just popped into my head. I knew that this had to be the case, and of course it is. So, underneath this we have our giant monster magnet, and we have uh, two very thick sheets of copper, and here we have a bismuth disc. It's uh, one of the bismuth discs that I cast. So, uh, since magnetism represents radiation, polarization, i.e. the creation of space, and bismuth is the absolute inverse of that, the world's most stable diamagnetic counterspatial element, then we should see inverse spin, uh, inverse resistance on either pole of the magnet as I uh, try to rotate the uh, move, the, uh, the bismuth, against the grain, as it were, of inverse um, magnetic uh, divergence or uh, strictly divergence, magnetic divergence of either pole. So let's take a look and see if that's the case, which of course I knew it would be the case. So you know, to notice I'm actually rotating the uh, copper discs counterclockwise and now I'm rotating the copper discs clockwise so bismuth moves somewhat freely but if I rotate them counterclockwise rotate the uh, copper counterclockwise the bismuth strongly resists movement which means I know the polarity of the magnetic divergence on this side of the super huge magnet so remember this side Counterclockwise, divergent magnetism, counting great resistance against our bismuth. So, we should get the opposite on the flip side of hey, this yeah, giant monster magnet. By the way, it hurts my eyes, as I've said before, if I stoop over this magnet for too long. It, it's called chromatomes. It's in the human eye. It causes a dull pain. It's definitely not comfortable at all, especially stooping over a massive magnet like this. So. Let's do the same thing on this side, counterclockwise. We should get movement inverse to the other side where our bismuth will move in counterclockwise movement of our copper discs. And what we should now get is if I rotate the copper discs clockwise, the bismuth should greatly resist the divergent magnetism, thereby proving, as if this isn't like the 20th time that I've already proven it a dozen different ways, 20 different ways, so, here we go, if I, don't, if I keep the copper discs flat, I'm not tilting them, obviously I've still got gravity in play, but if I keep the copper discs flat, you'll notice that inverse to the other side, if I move the copper plates, not copper discs, copper plates, Clockwise, the bismuth strongly resists movement. And just the inverse, if I move the copper plates counterclockwise, you'll actually notice a hypertrochoid pattern being drawn out. Of course, it's impossible to do it perfectly by hand, but I'd attach the copper plates to the machine, obviously, it would be readily visible. So I have the unevenness of my hands at play, and obviously gravity at play, and a couple of other factors, but nevertheless the point is proven. I think I've shown this to you before, these copper plates, if you just drop them on the neodymium. These are, this is actually about two and a half or three pounds. It's rather thick, two, plate, two plates of copper. Anyway, so. I'm writing a, a long article on uh, redefining inertia since uh, Newton was wrong and uh, we have to rethink a co-gravitational field and uh, what we think of inertia, of as inertia, is incorrect. Increasing acceleration means decreasing motion. Now, that seems counterintuitive, but it's perfectly logical. All movement towards counter space is the erasure of space, the erasure of motion. Any decreasing motion is decreasing inertia. Initial acceleration 
one thinks of inertia, but if there's an immediate fall off of acceleration, that's decreasing inertia. All increasing acceleration is increasing inertia, not from acceleration or movement, but the erasure of acceleration and movement. Because all increasing acceleration is the erasure of space, is the erasure of movement. Because all increasing acceleration is a move towards counter space, either dielectrically or gravitationally, but two are, two are one and the same, since gravity is merely a uh, attribute modality of mass, and mass itself is merely a condensate of dielectricity. This is a little bismuth cube. They call this a hopper crystal. It's like a hopper, like a shovel or a bucket. That's a description, not an explanation. Under perfect ideal conditions, you have to ask yourself why the world's most dielectric element makes these counterspatial hypertrochoid crystal formations, these uh, counterspatial hypercube formations. Obviously, the bismuth has to go somewhere, so it eventually curls into itself, as you can see here. But it actually makes a tesseract, or a counter-spatial cube, as you can see here. Magnetism is radiation. Dielectricity is what is driving magnetism. I need to stop making these videos at 5 o'clock in the morning, so you're going to have to excuse me. Eh, someone recently asked me, so, well, well if magnetism is ultimately merely the expression of dielectricity and discharge, then what's a really simple analogy that I could tell my eight-year-old daughter? And I tell her, well, think of a bicycle wheel that has its many spokes. If you actually spring a spoke, then boing! You know, you have a spoke that flies up. You can actually see that in the ferro cell. So, a really simple analogy for a child, or maybe some adults, is just thinking of a tight spoke as comprising non-movement High inertia, i.e. dielectricity, the discharge of that, boing, is the reciprocation, the creation of space, the necessitated polarization. What does polarization mean? It literally means the creation of space. Necessitated spatial reciprocation, divergence of dielectricity and discharge. Just kind of like uh, endless trillions of uh, spokes on, uh, on a... Uh, a subatomic uh, bicycle wheel that are actually springing from losing their tension. The loss of that inertia they actually raise up. Imagine a, a bicycle wheel that you cannot see. Dielectricity, a counter-spatial bicycle wheel. The only way you can actually see it or deduce its existence is from the breaking of a spoke where it diverges into quote-unquote existence, i.e. spatial polarization. That's kind of a, the most simple analogy when a, a person recently asked me how he could explain to his daughter uh, what magnetism is and how it relates to dielectricity. A really simple analogy because most people have seen a broken bicycle wheel spoke, you know, that it, it springs out from its hub and juts out into space. That's, uh, oddly enough, the ancient analogies for this in the Vedas and the Upanishads and uh, the ancient Greeks are just ripe, just ripe, 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 ripe. I've got that at the end of the third edition of the book. I'm working hard on the fourth edition of the book. I have to take a slight break because I murdered myself in the last edition, but I still didn't get to introduce even 30% uh, or so of what I wanted to put in, but it's all there. So anyway, thanks for watching. I showed you a new methodology no one's ever seen before. No one's ever seen this before. New methodology to prove inverse divergence, uh, inverse magnetic divergence using the bismuth disk and a super giant monster magnet. And now I'm going to have to stop because stooping over this huge magnet hurts my eyes and it's not a pleasant experience. So, catch you later.